Firstly, I, I'd like to reinforce what David said that um, as part of the industry, we'd like to compliment DAF on the amount of industry consultation they've had on this legislation. Uh, I gather that the regulations will be finished in May, but are very unlikely, if, if at all, to be actually passed by Parliament before Parliament prorogues. Where will that leave the process? Um, I think I've said a, a, a number of times in, in different fora now that uh, we will table the regulations uh, as we have uh, undertaken to do within six months of the, the bill becoming law um, and those regulations will sit through that, that process and sit through the election process. That's the normal way in which these things happen. It will be up to a new government to determine what they do with those regulations uh, in the new parliament. But for, for our purposes, uh, we are continuing with our processes, we are continuing with our consultation, and we are continuing on the basis that those regulations will be passed at some point in the new parliament and that we will be aiming for a uh, late November 2014 commencement of those uh, regulations. And certainly um, our outreach program and our consultation process will be very much based on that. And we will continue to work with yourself and others to make sure that um, we get out to industry and to a range of other stakeholders as much as we can. Thanks very much. There's another question right up at the back. Um. Uh, David Lionhelm, Farm Online. Um, I've been told by people working in the forestry or the timber sector that it will be impossible to comply with the Illegal Logging Prohibition Act without putting money into the pocket of Greenpeace or WWF or one of the uh, similar NGOs, but particularly those two. Um, WWF pursues its agenda via round tables and plays good cop. Greenpeace, Greenpeace pursues its agenda by public stunts and plays bad cop. And their uh, prediction is that uh, the bar will simply get raised through um, uh, collaboration with those organisations, such as Bunnings is engaged in. They're suggesting that it might be illegal timber today, but it'll be land, right, land rights for gay whales tomorrow, and if you don't comply, it'll be stunts against you. What do you have to say? Who wants that one? I, I, I might start, and then I might ask Mark to, to comment on this one. Um, look, all I want to say is that from the Australian government's perspective, um, I have found the engagement of all our stakeholders, and we've had them all in a room now three times and, and, and plenty of times before that as well. And certainly there are, you know, polarised positions, but people are working collaboratively together to try and bring home the, the, the requirements of the Act and indeed uh, to bring home the regulatory package. But, uh, you know, I can say that because I'm within DAF and, and, and that's my view about how things are happening, but it might be more instructive if you actually, uh, if I put that question to perhaps one of the other participants in the working group. Thank you. I'd like to respond from my pers personal experience of going from the confrontation that I've spoken about and to the co collaboration phase. And uh, there's, there's one statement that sums it up. You catch more flies with honey. Um, it is quite nerve-wracking to have to be open to that sort of input into your business model because nobody likes to be told what to do with their business model. Um, but I think the NGOs have become a lot more sophisticated and savvy about how to get what they want and how to compromise and negotiate to achieve some outcomes. So I don't think we should be afraid of it. Uh, to push it away is, is really feeding the fire. Uh, and that's all I'd like to say. Thanks very much. If I could use my prerogative, you all hinted at um, the significance of this problem of illegal logging. In case there's anybody in the room who doesn't have an order of magnitude, could you give us some idea of what proportion of the total amount of timber in circulation in Australia is likely to be of illegal sources? Is it 1%, 5%, 10%? Of domestic sources, I think it's probably zero. I mean, yes. we, we have, uh, as I said in my brief talk, we, we have 
immensely complex and long-standing state government systems enforcing uh, very high standards of regulatory compliance. So I'm, I'm as far as domestic sources go, I don't, there's zero problem. I, I mean, any problems that arise really would come from imported sources. As for your remark about the problem of the Stockholm syndrome that you sometimes get in the industry and its relationship with NGOs, I mean, I, I note what what Mark says, and I respect that. But, I mean, there is a genuine problem, I think, if, of uh, where democracy fits in all of this. I mean, we speak often of social licence as if it were just uh, an everyday benign, beneficent concept that we can all do something with. But, of course, properly understood, it completely undermines the principle of, of a representative democracy, where the decisions we make about legality, what we can and can't do, are actually made by elected representatives, not by self-appointed members of uh, ad hoc protest groups. I mean, I, I personally find that uh, a difficult issue to deal with, but uh, given that there's widespread acceptance in the community and indeed in this room of that principle, uh, I guess it's my problem. Thanks, David. Uh, how's the question? Sorry, I was just going to uh, respond. So uh, I agree that it's probably on the domestic side, it's very close to zero. Mm. Um, unfortunately, with uh, legal logging, you can't go down to the ABS and get a uh, catalogue out and work out exactly what it is. But uh, best estimates, I think, of uh, imported timber coming into Australia is uh, somewhat somewhere under 10%, and, and that uh, that is falling. That number is falling. Sorry, 10% of of imports of imported. Uh, timber products coming to Australia somewhere under 10% yeah. would may well be from illegal sources. But most of the imports of timber into Australia are from New Zealand, US and Canada and that's softwood which is pretty likely to be from sustainable not to mention legal sources so presumably it's some percentage of what comes from Indonesia and Malaysia. Well there's also the problem of imported pulp Yeah Thanks But I, I was just trying to get some magnitude of whether mm. it's... Not much. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, Steve Reid, ABAS. Um, I almost want to bring the discussion back to the framing that the chair gave at the start to remind ourselves about goals and tools and metrics. And it was, it was good to hear Mark Gom distinguish legal, legality as a goal from sustainability as a goal. But I thought the only bit of evidence we really had other than anecdote was the report from Chatham House that Andy Roby quoted about a large number of numbers of hectares of forest protected, which I hope means sustainably managed, um, and a large financial benefit to the countries of, uh, we're interested in here. So can Andy say a little bit more about the quality of that Chatham House report and whether that's the kind of <laughs> report we want to see more of in the future as we attest to the success or otherwise of this endeavour? Sure, that's a very good question. <laughs> we were all uh, wondering how they, these guys were going to do it when they started that in 2009. Um, and that some of it is is using this um, mass balance system of, of uh, a country says that it's produced this much legally uh, and this is how much it actually produced, which is more. Um, and so the difference is technically illegal. Uh, and you can gather that from reports that are sort of lodged in the ministries of forestry in these countries. Um, but they, they, they obviously were a little suspicious of those statistics because, of, you know, these are developing countries with, um, where you know, the, the quality of the collection is not good. And so they did some other stuff based around perceptions. Um, are, am, I, am I confident in those figures? No, not at all. Nobody is. Um, but it's taken us up a level in terms of, of quantities. And they're now in the process of doing it again, uh, using trying to develop some more uh, metric, um, em empirical-based um, estimates. So starting to look at uh, remote sensing data um, and looking at trade statistics that come from the trade, which tend to be more reliable, they, they actually tell they actually know how much they're trading <laughs> on the whole. And in fact, the importing statistics were pretty reliable. Uh, those came from importers uh, in Europe. Um, but yeah, no, I mean it was it's you know it's quotable because it's Chatham House, but you know <laughs> Chatham House rule. So I'm not going to be attributed for this. It's it's a bit dodgy. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, Mark. <laughs> sorry. 
Great. Thank you. There's another question over the side. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Grant Johnson, Australian Forest Products Association. Randy, uh, you were saying that under the uh, European regulation and SVLK that there's 100% certainty of zero risk. That's zero risk of illegality, presumably. Um, I'm just wondering how far it moves Indonesia, if you like, um, without disparaging their efforts, but how far it moves Indonesia towards a more sustainable basis for forestry management. It's one thing for it to be legal, of mm. course, but if it's not sustainable, you're not really getting to the intents of the Commonwealth Act and more generally towards you know, the uh, stopping the degradation of rainforest systems. Good question. Um, and uh, I, think, I think the answer is that um, the, the way that the treaty is, is devised, um, you have to have a 100% or nothing acceptance. So the VPA says once the, the SVL car has reached a sufficiently high level of what they call operationality, right, which is a, obviously was also a word devised in the committee uh, in Brussels, uh, which means how effective is, is the system working? And, and we're actually just going through the process of evaluating that starting next month. So there'll be a joint team of experts from Europe and Indonesia assessing operationality. We're never going to get to 100% of, of the scheme. It'll be a, you know, 95%, 90%. What, what a percentage of what? <laughs> We're back to Chatham House and, and metrics again. Um, but the fact is that for the importer, they want to know whether they're at risk of prosecution. And so what, what um, Indonesia and Europe is offering is security of that. And it's done as a driver and as a support to countries like Indonesia that are going the right way. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been involved in Indonesia now for 10 years, and believe you me, uh, when I started, it was eight out of ten logs were illegal in the country, and that was the government's own estimates. Okay, and we think we're down to about 50% now. Okay, so it's going down. So we're starting with legality. But the government's introduced another scheme, um, a sustainable forest management certification scheme that is based around the FSC principles. Um, it's called PHPL. Don't ask me to tell you what that means. Um, but it's basically sustainable forest management. Um, and I think we're going to see that scheme uh, morphing towards either the FSC or the PEFC scheme because they, they need to market this um, under one of those two umbrellas internationally for it to be acceptable. And in fact, uh, the figure I think I quoted of uh, 10 million hectares of legal forest includes a large chunk that have been certified as sustainable. The standard for sustainability hasn't gone through a multi-stakeholder process. So it's not like FSC or PFC in that respect. So there are still some things to work on in that regard. But in Indonesia is not stopping at legality. That's what I really wanted to say. Yeah. I'm afraid that we're already nibbling into coffee time. So unless anybody has a really urgent burning question, um, I think I'm going to have to wind it up there. And thank our speakers very much for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you.